Hello, you absolute legends. The Castlevania franchise is one of the longest running and most beloved video game series of all time, and it all started on the original Castlevania, released all the way back in 1986 on the Famicom Disk System. The original game is now almost 40 years old, and you'd think by this point games would have found everything there is to find and unlocked every secret Castlevania has hidden within its code, but this is far from reality. In the last several years, Castlevania has been blown wide open with a slew of new major exploits that have enabled speedrunners to break the game in ways that were never thought possible. And just last month, Castlevania speedrunners hit the jackpot, discovering the holy grail of video game exploits, arbitrary code execution. In speedrunning, this is the ultimate glitch, a way to tell the game to run any code you want through in-game manipulation alone. With arbitrary code execution, you can essentially do whatever you want as long as it doesn't completely break the game, whether this be give yourself items or warp straight to the end of the game. And of course, in speedrunning, both are extremely useful. Castlevania has 18 stages, and the fastest anyone has played through all stages of the game and reached the end credits is 10 minutes and 41 seconds achieved by SBD Wolf, with the speedrunner Trisk half a second behind. But at the end of last month, the world record holder SBD Wolf literally cracked Castlevania's code and discovered a way to skip half of the game by reaching the end credits from the end of stage 10, in the process cutting the world record in half and allowing him to finish the game in just 5 5 minutes and 49 seconds. On its surface, this glitch seems very simple. There isn't a lot of crazy, random movement like you would see in some other games where Ace is used, but the knowledge that was needed in order to figure out these specific inputs that lead to warping to the end credits from stage 10 is really impressive and it's very interesting. So today, let's take a quick look at arbitrary code execution in Castlevania and how speedrunners are now able to use this glitch to finish the game in just 5 minutes. I really hope you enjoy. Now Legends, a big shout out to today's video sponsor NordVPN, and I'll quickly show you what I use NordVPN for. So last week I wanted to watch the Godfather series on Netflix, but alas, only the first one is available in my country. Luckily with NordVPN this isn't a problem. I just did a quick Google search to see which country part 2 is available in, changed my country through NordVPN, refreshed the page, and there it is in all its glory. I get access to way more content with NordVPN, and I'm not just talking about TV shows and movies either. My country is terrible when it comes to censorship. There are so many websites they try to stop me from accessing, it's actually ridiculous. But with NordVPN, I can access whatever I want, whenever I want, as it should be. For me personally, that's already well worth the value. But of course, with NordVPN, I get all of the added benefits like extra security that I'm sure most of you already know. Using NordVPN is really easy, and it's the fastest VPN on the planet. And if you use my link in the description, you'll get four months free when you sign up on a two-year plan. And if you're not happy for any reason, Nord offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, just click the link in the description and get Nord today. The Cutting Room Floor is a website dedicated to discovering and showcasing unused content within video games. In January of 2016, the Cutting Room Floor founder, Rachel May, added an entry for the original Castlevania, including a list of known bugs. One of those bugs was called the Screen Transition Bug. This glitch occurs at the end of Stage 10. Normally, in order to reach these stairs, which take you to Stage 11, you're supposed to jump from the lower platform to the platform on the right, and then back to the top platform on the left. The game's protagonist Simon can't jump high enough to go from the lowest to the highest platform in one jump, so using the middle platform should be a necessity. However, you can make it from the lower platform all the way to the top if you perform a damage boost off a bat near the apex of your jump. It seems utterly meaningless to skip the middle platform, but the fascinating thing is that if you do use the bat to damage boost to the top and then try to exit the stage, the game crashes. And what's even more bizarre is if you use the damage boost and then use your whip and then exit the stage, the game doesn't crash. The game also doesn't crash if you damage boost up and then jump before exiting. It only crashes if you damage boost up and then immediately exit. What on earth is going on? The reason this happens is because of some weird choices from the programmer in how to deal with the cutscene leading into the next stage. At the beginning of stage 11, you can see Simon walking up some stairs from the bottom of the screen. This cutscene is unique and doesn't happen anywhere else in the game. The developer obviously thought this looked really cool, but it did present an immediate problem. Stages are divided into several substages. Throughout the game, stairs are used to transition between substages. And the way it works is if Simon's position 
position is a specific Y value, whether that be near the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen, the game will transition up or down to the next substage. For example, if we are on stage 2, substage 1, and Simon goes down a staircase, he will be taken to stage 2, substage 0, and vice versa. Functionally, it doesn't matter if Simon is moving upwards or downwards on a staircase. If he hits the required Y value at all, the substage will transition. In the case of the beginning of stage 11, this cool animation of Simon walking upstairs didn't work, because Simon crosses the specific Y value as he climbs the stairs. So the level immediately would have transitioned one substage down as soon as the level began. In order to prevent this from happening, the programmer added some extra code that said if a particular value in memory equals zero, don't perform the substage transition. And it worked because the value the programmer chose is normally zero. But it's not always zero. Back Back in the day when memory was a limited resource, programmers often needed to cut corners. And one way they did this was by using a single value in memory for multiple different purposes. There could be several completely independent and unrelated functions all using the same byte of information for instructions. And in this case, the value the programmer chose to rely upon to cancel this substage transition is also used by Simon's kneeling animation after he takes damage or falls from a height. After Simon takes damage or lands, from a sufficient height, he enters this kneeling pose for exactly 17 frames. As soon as Simon lands and begins to kneel, a value in memory is set to 16. It then counts down by 1 every frame until the timer reaches negative 1, at which point he stands up. When Simon stands up, this value remains at negative 1 until Simon either jumps or uses his whip, at which time the value is set to 0. And it just so happens it's this value that the programmer used to rely upon to cancel the substage transition at the beginning of stage 11. It's this value that needs to be zero. And normally, it is. Because in order to reach the top platform, you need to jump, which resets the value to zero. This is probably why the end of the stage is designed the way that it is. The programmer knew he needed the value to be zero, so he forced the player to jump to reach the end, which achieves that result. When you damage boost to the top platform, however, that value remains at negative one after Simon stands back up. So if you leave the stage now, in stage 11 when it checks that value, it won't be zero. And because of this, the game doesn't tell Simon to not perform the substage transition. As soon as he hits that Y value, which is almost immediately, the substage decreases by one. In the case of stage 11, you enter in substage zero. So if you subtract one, this ends up going down to substage 255, as there are only 256 possible values in a byte. Now spoiler alert, the programmer did not design a substage 255, so there is no substage to load. But that doesn't stop the game from trying to load something, and the result is a garbled mess that ultimately crashes the game. Now we know why the glitch happens, but it's only the first piece of the puzzle, because now we have to figure out how to use the screen transition glitch to skip the rest of the game. And that's where the Castlevania Mastermind SBD Wolf comes in. Last month, Castlevania speedrunner and current world record holder SBD Wolf decided to take a closer look at the screen transition glitch to try and understand exactly what's going on. A lot of times in speedrunning, it's these really game-breaking glitches that often lead to major breakthroughs or new usable exploits. The programmer did not specifically program anything for stage 11, substage 255, which is why the game crashes. But obviously, the game still tries to load something, even if it's seemingly random. And the question is, are any of the values the game uses to try and load whatever it's loading able to be manipulated by us, the player? And in this case, the answer is yes. There is a value the game is trying to read that we can affect. And because of this, it may be possible to manipulate that value in such a way that yields a positive result. The value in question is primarily used by the game to determine Simon's sprite animation when walking. Simon has three different sprites that oscillate back and forth to give the appearance of walking and the game uses simple math to cycle through these in a way that gives Simon the appearance of walking. In memory, there is a stored value that for this example we will say starts with a value of zero. When you walk in any direction, the game adds 36 per frame to this value. When this number becomes greater than 255 and wraps back around, the game tells Simon to move to the next sprite. This means that when you're walking, each sprite will last on average around seven frames. SBD Wolf quickly realized that if 
if this value was 113 when performing the transition screen glitch, this would tell the game to execute as code a specific area of memory that just so happened to be the save file data. Now before we get to that, we have to figure out how to make this value 113 in the first place. The solution arises from the way the counter resets when Simon uses his whip. When Simon uses his whip normally, this resets the step counter to zero. But if you jump and use the whip while in the air, and he finishes the whipping animation before he lands, it will reset this value to one. We don't know exactly why whipping while jumping is different so that it resets to one instead of zero. It could be because this value is also used by something else that needs it to be one while Simon is in the air. But the end result is that by using this technique, we can switch the value to an odd number. We can then calculate that after resetting this sprite counter to 1, we would need to exit stage 10 after walking exactly 60 frames. If we do this, the value will be 113 going into stage 11. Using this information, SBD Wolf calculated that if he jumped from this exact pixel, resetting the counter while in the air, by the time he reaches the stage exit, he would have walked exactly 60 frames. While doing the first jump, it's also mandatory to look to the left because this will ensure that when the bat spawns, the bat that we will use for the damage boost, it spawns from the left. This is because the direction Simon is facing determines where the bat will spawn from. So assuming we did this correctly, and the value is 113, the game's code will use this value to jump to and read the memory from the save file data. This is where the magic happens, and this is where knowledge in programming is essential to figuring out how to do this in the first place. The save files save several pieces of information. You have the name of the file, the stage you were last on, the amount of times you've beaten the game, the the amount of times you've reached the game over screen, and your high score. It's not a lot, but it's just enough to write a tiny piece of code. Now when you're on the save file screen, the game is using those stored values in a particular way. It's using them to tell the game where to start you when you load up. But when we perform the screen transition glitch, and it tries to read this data, it's reading it as something that needs to be executed. So by saving specific values into the save file, you can write instructions for the game to run after performing the glitch. SBD Wolf used the data in the first save file simply to stabilize the game, because without adjusting some values in memory, the game was crashing. Then in the second save file, he uses that data to write code that simply tells the game to jump to and run a specific line of code. And that code is the routine to start the end credits. The player then uses the third save file to play the actual run. Setting up the save file data is by far the most tedious part of this entire process. To store the correct values on the second save file, you need to beat the game a total of 76 times. In a recent stream, SBD Wolf spent over 12 hours running through the game over and over again just to set up this save data. Though if you want to cut corners, players can also choose to inject the save file data directly into the disk without actually playing it. In the end, when everything comes together, it looks like this. I think this is two. Yes! GG, I think that's a new record. We need to retime it though, because this is getting to the point where uh, it's a small one, if it is. As I mentioned right at the beginning of the video, when you see it performed, it doesn't seem that complicated. But under the surface, there is a ton of deep knowledge that was required in order to figure this out. If you want the exact technical explanation as to why this happens, I'll put some text on screen now, which you can pause and read. Naturally, because this breaks the game in such a large way, this new speedrunning route has been put into a new category, specifically for arbitrary code execution. So the sanctity of the full game speedrun still remains. A huge Congratulations to SBD Wolf on this discovery. It's honestly incredible. He also helped me learn more about it, so please show your support by following him on YouTube and Twitch. I will put the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching, you legends. I hope you're having a fantastic day, and I will see you in the next video.